Welcome. In this video, we'll be looking at the inverse square law in the context of gravitational field strength and gravitational force. Just in case you're concerned that maybe the inverse squared law and indeed orbits and gravitational forces are theoretical and not really in existence, what you see on the screen at the moment is an electronic image of the various satellites that are orbiting planet Earth. We'll zoom that out. There are literally thousands of objects that are orbiting our planet as we speak. Okay, let's just select a couple of them. For example, this one here. Okay, this is part of a rocket body as we've got a description here. It's traveling at nearly, you know, four and a half kilometers a second. This object over here. Okay, it's traveling at five kilometers a second. Okay, it gets as close as 550 kilometers to the Earth in its particular orbit. We'll keep moving around. Okay, here, this is debris. Um, it's floating around, and it's got a speed of nearly 7 kilometers per second floating around our planet. So what we're about to look at in terms of an inverse squared law, in terms of the effect of radius upon field strength or force, has great applications um, to everyone on our planet and our civilization. Let's now have a look at orbital rotations through the FET simulator, one of my favorite websites, FET. Um, and this is their gravity and orbits simulator. So at the moment, we've got the sun and earth. We can let that run. We can place a grid and a pathway. So the earth pretty much travels very close to a circular orbit around the sun. And we can speed that up if we like as well. Getting it ripping around the sun. And we can see, as we know, that will take around 365 days to complete. Now we know there's gravitational force between these two. Uh, the Earth is being attracted towards the Sun, to the center of the Sun, and the Sun is being attracted to the center of the Earth. Of course, I have a look at the tangential velocity, have a snapshot there. We can see that the direction of the force from the Earth to the Sun is perpendicular 90 degrees to the Earth's velocity. We can also have a look at, have a look at the moon traveling around our planet. Okay, so we can see as it travels around. There we go, the moon going around the sun. And we can have a look again at the gravitational force. The moon is attracted into the center of the Earth due to gravitational force. And the Earth is actually attracted out towards the moon's center of mass at the same amount as well. Finally, one last one to have a look at. Here we have the International Space Station and it's traveling around Earth as well. Okay, so it travels and it's, uh, its period in rotation is in minutes rather than days or a year. So again, it's a circular motion. It has a gravitational force of attraction to the center of the Earth and likewise the Earth is attracted to the center of the International Space Station. Um, a good little simulation to visualize what's happening with orbits around our planet. The FET simulation of the Gravity Force Lab is another way of looking at Newton's law of gravity. We know that F equals G M1 M2 over R squared, where F is the force between the two objects due to gravity. G is the universal gravitation constant. M or M1 is the first mass and M2 is the second mass divided by R squared where R is the radius of separation or the distance between the two masses, center of masses. So this particular simulator allows us to investigate what effect changing these variables of masses and radii has upon the overall gravitational force between the two objects. These are very, very small values and that's because the universal gravitational constant has a value with an exponent of 10 to the negative 11. Okay, so it's going to make any masses other than planets quite a low or small gravitational force. So here you can see that by increasing the mass of mass 2, if we look at the forces between these two objects, if we increase the mass, the force increases. That makes sense. The greater the mass, the greater the gravitational force. Um, and you'll notice both the force of M1 from M2 and the force of M2 from M1 are exactly the same. This is Newton's third law, equal and opposite forces, or pairs of equal and opposite forces. How about if we move them closer? 
If we move objects closer together, we find the gravitational force between the two increases as well. Uh, likewise, if we separate them further apart, we find that the gravitational force between the two objects is reduced. So this is just a little simulation one can play with to try and emphasize Newton's law of gravitation. Let's look at our first scenario. We have here a 10 ton rocket orbiting the Earth at a radius of 36,000 kilometers. And our first task is to calculate the gravitational force experienced between the orbiting rocket and the Earth. Just to clarify, this is no thrusters or boosters running. It's simply in an orbit and rotating around under the gravitational force in a circular path. Okay. The information that we're given, the mass of the Earth, the big M, its value here is 5.98 by 10 to the 24 kilograms, and the universal gravitation constant as well is provided to us. So let's have a look, please. First of all, here's our information set out with F, the force between the two, is a question. Here's all our variables. Here's our appropriate equation, which is Newton's law of gravitation. Have a go. See if you can solve the force existing between these two objects. I'll press pause. If you like, you can press pause and check out your answer with mine. Okay, here we go. What we ended up with when we put in all our variables and did our correct calculations, the force between those two objects is 3,078 newtons, which I've rounded to 3.1 by 10 to the 3 to 2 significant figures. Okay, hope you got that one right. What happens now if we have the same rocket orbiting the Earth at double the original radius? So my task two is to calculate the gravitational force experience between the rocket and the Earth at this new orbit at double the radius. So again, let's set up all our information. We want to know the we want to know the force between the two. We have the mass of the Earth. I'm going to change that to a little mass of the rocket, so we know that the smaller mass is the rocket. Okay, the gravit the universal gravitational constant we're given, and the new radius, which was double the original 36,000 kilometers. So it's 7.2 by 10 to the 7 meters. 10 to the 7. Be careful when we have kilometers. We need to multiply by a thousand. So that's why we have such a large number here. So here's our equation again. Can you substitute the values in, make your calculation, pause it, and come back when you're done? Welcome back. When we do the work on this, we find that the force now at this double the radius, with everything else being held the same, is 769 newtons, or 7.7 .7 by 10 to the 2 newtons, to two significant figures. Move on to our third scenario. You guessed it. We've now got triple the radius for exactly the same rocket. We want to know or ask you to calculate the gravitational force experienced between the orbiting rocket and the Earth at this new altitude. Our data is here. We've got our new radius, which is three times the original radius. We want to know the force between the two. Let's change that to a little m again, so we know the little m is that of the spaceship or the rocket. So go ahead, calculate this. Press pause while you do your calculation and come back when you're finished. Okay, hopefully when you put in all your data with the correct radius, and of course, remembering to square the radius, common mistake by many students, you'll end up with an answer of 342 newtons, or 3.4 by 10 to the 2 newtons, with two significant figures. How'd you go? All right, let's have a look at these three. So our initial radius, which was, I think, 36,000 kilometers, we ended up having a force of 3,078 newtons. When we doubled that radius and held everything else the same, we ended up with a force of 769 newtons, considerably less. When we tripled our original radius, we end up with a force of 342 newtons. Okay, so clearly, if we're holding everything else constant and only changing the radius, this is having some effect. So here we can see, comparing this value at double the radius to our original force value, a new second force here at double the radius is a quarter of what the original value was. We double the radius, we get a quarter of the original force. Likewise, if we triple the radius, we end up with one ninth of the original force. Now this is called the inverse square law. Can you see any relationship between doubling the radius and getting one quarter of the force, and tripling the radius and getting one ninth of the force? Inverse squared law. Okay, so there's a nice summary. Let's have a look. This equation we're using, which is Newton's law of gravitation. Gravitational constant is constant for all these 
rockets. The mass of the Earth is constant for all these rockets. The little mass of the rocket remains constant at 10 ton. The only thing that's changing is the radius between each one of these orbits. So when I double the radius, here by the way, the only thing that's changing was the radius it means that force is proportional to really just the one on R squared. These variables don't change. They're constants, in fact. They're not variables at all. The only thing that changes in each one of these orbits is the radius. So when I double the radius, my force is proportional to 1 over a factor of 2 squared. 2 squared is 4. four. So I end up with a force is proportional to a quarter. So I'm getting one quarter of the force here that I had originally. Likewise, when I triple the radius, the force is proportional to 1 on R squared. The factor I've got here not the actual radius, but the factor is multiplying it by 3. When I square that factor, I get a 9. So this force at this triple radius is one ninth of what it was originally. I hope you're seeing the relationship with the inverse squared pattern. So as a quick summary, here's our equation, which is Newton's law of gravitation. And from that, in each of these three scenarios at different orbits, we know the force is proportional to 1 on r squared. So as a quick summary, for a given satellite and a planet, we're not changing the planet, it's the same planet and moving the satellite in different locations. When you double the radius, you get one on the factor of two squared is a quarter. You have a quarter of the gravitational force. When you triple the radius, it's one on three squared, one ninth of the gravitational force originally experienced. And if you quadruple the radius, you get one sixteenth the gravitational force. Likewise, if we work backwards, if we started at some large radius and we halve the radius, 1 on a half squared becomes 4. So if we half the radius, we get 4 times the gravitational force. The third, if we, if we third the radius, a large radius, and we bring it in to a third of the original length, we get 1 on a third squared becomes 9, 9 times the gravitational force. And if we quarter the radius, we get 16 times the gravitational force. That should make sense. The inverse nature means when you move planets and satellites further apart, you get a weaker gravitational force. When you move them closer together, you get a stronger gravitational force. Just finally, I want people to realize also that we could have calculated the gravitational field strength rather than the force between the two objects, and it works on the same principle. When you double the radius, you get one quarter the gravitational field strength. When you triple the radius, you get one ninth the gravitational field strength. When you quadruple the radius, you get one sixteenth the gravitational field strength, and the same when you're moving closer together. So this proportionality rule can be applied to both the gravitational force between two objects and also the gravitational field strength. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you've enjoyed it and you found some benefit in understanding this physics concepts, please like my video, share my video, give me comments, and also subscribe. Thanks for watching.